Okay, so everybody, welcome. We are here for a call to discuss the work that Manuel here has been doing with Parts Unlimited. Manuel is the author, co-author of Team Topologies. Uh, many of you here may already know of him from the previous book club that we did. He's our book club veteran. Uh, you all know him, you all love him, and we're so pleased to have him here with us to talk through this work. So, Manuel. Thank you, Alex. So as you've know, as you know, as you perhaps know, uh, Maxine saw us speak at DevOps Enterprise Summit, and she asked if we were interested to have a look at Parts Unlimited since they were going through some changes that seemed similar to what we were talking about. And then she got in contact with the book, Team Topologies, um, and we've been uh, discussing the transformations going on at Parts Unlimited. So I'm going to show you um, kind of the high level ideas and um, conclusions we've we've had from our conversations. So I'm going to share the screen with you. And while he's pulling that up, one quick note too. Feel free to post all of your questions in the Slack channel during this, and we'll have time at the end to address those. So we're looking at how the ideas of team topologies um, have been applied or what could, could be applied at Parts Unlimited. Um, so some of you might know that this is the book that me and Matthew Skelton have written uh, called Team Topologies, Organizing Business and Technology Teams for, Flo for Fast Flow, published by T Revolution Press. And so there are four core ideas we want to share with you today. Um, they will be included in a, a larger report for Parts Unlimited. The first topic is uh, team first approach. So by talking with some of Parts Unlimited's um, employees and with Maxine and others, we've seen there are some concerns at the moment about current team organization. Um, not always, not always clear what uh, each team is working on. Uh, some teams are being pulled in many directions and working on Horizon 3 activities, while well, they also have to worry about Horizon 1 and 2, keeping the business uh, running. Um, there is sometimes a mismatch between the, the business and technology, even though now most teams are within a business area, most technology teams. Uh, sometimes there is some lack of understanding of what is possible to achieve by, by each team. And finally, some teams have reporting, um, been reporting a sort of overflow of communication on Slack. And um, so essentially having too much um, communication to many channels going on and people get a little bit lost at times. So this is what we found by talking with different people. Um, so we wanted to share, first of all, what is our understanding of our team uh, within team topologies, which we believe can be helpful for um, Parts Unlimited. Obviously, you don't want, um, we don't want very few large teams and we don't want a uh, sprawl of too many very small teams. Um, so it's this heuristic of having team size around seven plus minus two that we know about um, from Scrum and other, other kind of um, agile methodologies. It makes sense also uh, because that's how the size of teams that people can really trust each other deeply and uh, perform and better achieve higher performance. Um, sometimes can grow up to 15 and in some scenarios this might um, make sense for Parts Unlimited. For example, if you're exploring a new um, a new business opportunity kind of in Horizon 3 and you need really people from different angles to, to look at it. Um, but at some point, you probably want to try to reduce that down to 7 plus minus 2. So we think of teams as a long-lived group of, of individuals working together with high levels of trust. Um, and that's what enables high performance for that, for that team. So this doesn't mean that people cannot change teams or people cannot kind of work more on Horizon 3 or uh, things like this. But in general, we expect the team to be stable 
uh, to be long lived and to be aligned to the business and, and part of the business segment, in fact. Um, and then, you know, people can, can move between teams, but the team still exists. And we also believe that part of the reason why um, some of the teams feel overloaded or being pulled into many directions has to do with this idea of cognitive load, which is the total amount of mental effort being used in the working memory. So as defined by John Sweller uh, back in 1988. And so I'm not going uh, and during this presentation, go into detail about different types of cognitive load, but essentially we're saying if there's too much that the team needs to worry about to be able to maintain, change and fix and support the software that they're responsible for, um, then you know, every, they, they won't be able to perform those activities well. Um, so this idea that if the software is too big to fit in our heads as a team, uh, which comes from uh, the idea of uh, Daniel Nor North, who said, you know, software that's too big for uh, one person's head. Um, so we're applying that to teams that works against the agility that we would like to have, that you would like to have at Parts Unlimited. And so we want to right size the teams to the software that they're responsible for or um, and vice versa. So the software size should be adequate to the team's uh, capacities. Um, I, excuse me for including a tweet in this presentation, but I think there's no better way than, than this tweet that I've uh, found recently by um, Rob Mini. And so in a way, cognitive load is asking the team, how does it feel to build your software? How confident are you that you can test, you can release, operate, support, debug problems and fix it? So we're looking at build and run teams that are able to do all of these facets effectively. So that means the size of the software and the complexity of the software they are responsible has to be adequate for that. So we believe this is something that has not been explicitly been addressed at Parts Unlimited. And so it could be um, an interesting and, and valuable approach to um, really ask the teams, you know, if you are responsible not only to to deliver this piece of software, but actually support it and make sure, um, as we know, one of our key, key goals at Parts Unlimited is to um, deliver the best possible customer experience. And we, want, we need to be able to support and fix issues as quickly as possible. So that depends on the cognitive load of the team. In other words, we're saying that each service at Parts Unlimited must be fully owned by a team with sufficient cognitive capacity to build and operate it and also and test and, and support and so on. So some services at Parts Unlimited have also been unclearly defined in terms of ownership. So that's also another part to address. So understand the cognitive load of the teams today um, and then also look at the services and software that you have running um, both from uh, core and, and context areas, but all of those, even if it's context, they need to be uh, owned by a team, even if they don't change frequently. So our recommendations uh, in this area are to start by assessing the team's cognitive load. Um, this can be as simple or should be as simple as asking the teams, you know, how, how well do you feel that you can support and solve issues in your software uh, and make changes quickly so that we can get to market with innovation as quickly as possible. And you just start by detecting which teams are feeling anxious or are feeling that they don't have the necessary knowledge around their um, services to provide this effectively. And so after you do that, you can start to then address the problem and, and how can we uh, improve it. So that, that's points two and three. Uh, we can detect gaps in the team's capabilities. Perhaps uh, the problem is that they don't have enough uh, knowledge around some domains like test automation or um, UX and, and good design and, and this type of, of thing. So we're going to look at that in section two for enablement. And another aspect that it might be um, 
that might help us reduce the cognitive load on, on the delivery teams is to identify how, which platform, platforms do we have today and how can they help? Perhaps there are some services we could create in the platform to really accelerate the delivery teams and reduce the, the demand we're putting on them to understand all these different um, areas. So I'll start with streams and platforms. Um, in the book, Team Topologies, we talk about four distinct types of teams. Uh, Stream-aligned teams, which I've heard often here at Parts Unlimited referred to as feature teams. Uh, I believe that's the terminology you've uh, used. So we, we talk about stream teams in terms of because we want to make sure we're talking about streams aligned to, um, sorry, about teams aligned to a stream of, of work that is meaningful for the business. Um, and, but essentially these are build and run teams, teams that have, that are kind of the heartbeat for Parts Unlimited that are delivering uh, not only the currently running systems, but also the innovation and the new ideas that are trying to, are being tried um, to expand our market share. Um, so those are kind of the heartbeat. And then you have three other types of teams that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, so we'll start with, with platform teams. So currently there are uh, different business streams that have been, some of these have been around for a long time at Parts Unlimited, some are new. And so there is also some discussion um, in the company around which business streams should exist. Um, so from manufacturing, in-store sales and all the, the software and, and, and tools associated with that, e-commerce, uh, the new engine sensor that, as you know, have, has been growing um, very quickly and is a, a great opportunity for Parts Unlimited to reach new markets. And the um, parts delivery, which is also growing, um, delivery of parts within um, four hours. And, and so there is some question whether that should also be a stream um, for the business. So essentially we should we recommend identifying um, more clearly what are these business streams so that we can then align the, the, the stream teams inside of these business areas. And in terms of platform, you have today um, two, mostly two platforms that um, have been started with the Unicorn Project and uh, Maxine and, and her teams have created this um, CICD platform, uh, Uniketo, and Narwhal for data APIs and um, and all, all the kind of data services, uh, which are being now evolved into with Project Shamu, um, according to to what we've been told. So this is our very good start. So there was the work that has been made by the um, the Unicorn Project team and the um, the Panther team has shown that it's very valuable for uh, the other teams at Parts Unlimited to be able to rely on these platforms. But as the adoption grew of these platforms also has shown that um, they were underfunded to some extent, they were not um, scaling well, right? So some of the current concerns about the viability of these platforms um, have to do with uh, sometimes lack of clarity on how do we onboard new teams to the to these platforms, um, which teams are responsible for for them, um, and how do we scale as more and more uh, as the, with the growing adoption of these platforms. So let's we would like first to just be on the same page about what a platform should be. Um, we like this definition by Evan Butcher of a digital platform as the foundation of self-service APIs, tool services, um, but also knowledge and support, which are arranged as a compelling internal product. So in, in conversations with Maxine and, and Kurt, um, they are aligned with this definition. And in fact, they, that's something that they had realized that the platforms that you have today at Parts Unlimited should be treated as uh, internal products. So there shouldn't be really a difference in how these platforms are delivered and supported compared to uh, customer-facing products. 
so in this definition, it's very important to understand that if we want knowledge and support to be um, fundamental aspects of the platform, then we need teams and again, long live teams around these services in the platform. So when we, we talk about treating the platform as a product, that means we need to think about how do we make this platform reliable, usable and, and fit for purpose. So in this case, for internal customers who are the other um, engineering teams that parts unlimited, but it's really the same idea as for external facing customers. And we believe part of the sometimes lack of clarity around how does how do the, the platform services work today, who are the teams uh, and how do we onboard or how do we use the, the platforms has to do perhaps with unclear ex, um, interactions, expected interactions with the platform teams. So what we recommend and we talk about in the book is the platform team when they are working on a new service or a, a major version of an existing service, um, such as the, the CI CD services, for example, then they should do this in collaboration, direct collaboration with the stream teams or, or one of your feature teams that actually is going to use this new service or this evolution. So that this is developed, this platform service in an agile way as well, uh, iterative way with fast feedback from the um, from the stream teams. So we don't say that the platform team is now going on, you know, in for three months or six months and work on this service and come back to us. We know from our uh, from your history as well that this type of waterfall or you know approach of just teams working in in isolation in their silos doesn't. Uh, bring the benefits in the end. And so what we recommend is that the platform teams make this much more clear. And when they have a request for a new service, they identify for how long should we be collaborating with this stream team on this new service? Um, what do we need to define in terms of how the APIs should work, the interface, so that when we actually develop the service, it's going to be fit for what this uh, stream teams need rather than the platform team going on and, and developing this on on the side and, and coming back to find out it doesn't fit their needs. So strong collaboration for new services. And then when you have services in the platform that are becoming that more um, widely adopted and you need to worry more about the reliability, the support. So for example, you had that incident with the Unicat Hall um, CICD system that at some point um, it was down and no one could build and no one could deliver changes through their pipelines. Um, and so it, this doesn't mean that those problems will never happen, but the platform team uh, needs to be more proactive. Uh, so there should be an on-call support for the platform services so that since they are in the path of the of our customer facing products so when there's a problem with the platform we are directly impacting our ability to um, serve our customers quickly and efficiently and so defining on call support making clear what is the current status of these different services like unicatol and narwhal and etc um how does how what are the communication channels either in in slack or uh, or perhaps different types of incidents require different types of communication. Uh, what is the response time for incidents with the platform and understanding the impact if there's some downtime planned for a platform service, making sure that's communicated um, and coordinated with the teams that use that service. So as you can see, it's in, in general the same ideas as for external customers, uh, services for external customers but applied to the platform as well and finally we we need very good product management on the platform so as the adoption has grown 
on some of these services already, you see that there are more and more requests from the different teams for changes to the an evolution of those services. So it's very important to have a good product management that can be uh, setting, help set priorities correctly for the requests coming in um, and avoid in general becoming a bottleneck in, in, in the platform, making sure you are addressing the highest um, and the, the most important and, and that issues that the teams have so that you can really help them accelerate their delivery. In general, kind of the overall pattern that we recommend is something like this, where you should expect in the beginning, imagine the yellow uh, team here is, a, is one of your feature teams and the blue is one of the platform teams, for example, for CICD. If the, if the feature team has a new request, a new um, need around the CICD system, then you should expect in the beginning there will be strong collaboration between the two um, and dedicate that effort. As the, the new service or the new version becomes clearer and the interface is clearer and the usage uh, has been validated by the, the feature team, then you expect uh, the, the platform team to not need as much collaboration with the feature team and to focus more on establishing this new service or version um, as you know stable, reliable with proper documentation so that at the end it can be used by all the other feature teams that need it. Um, so obviously at that point has to be a solution that is scalable, that is reliable and that's easy to to use. We should say that this is general pattern. There are occasions and you will face this where actually the service we thought was stable and could be used by many teams, but actually it was a good fit for only a few of the teams because those teams are perhaps more mature. And so you should expect that actually we found out that we need to collaborate with another team to actually make the platform um, usable for them as well because they're coming from a different starting point. So one interesting idea that we propose is you are at the high growth speed right now in terms of um, acquiring new um, recruiting new engineers. So whenever there's an onboarding either of a new team or of a new engineer that needs to learn how to use the platform services, take that as an opportunity to understand are those services adequately defined and are they actually easy to use and understand? Uh, because these people, the, the new hires coming in can give you fit, new feedback that you were not, um, you haven't had until now as a platform team. So overall recommendations, um, better define who are the platform teams and uh, provide adequate funding for them. And as you grow the platforms, then you also need to think about how do, are the different teams grouped. So typically each platform team will be um, aligned to one service, one team for the CICD service, one team for um, monitoring service, for example, and so you need to think about the structure around the, the, this group of teams um, a little bit. Also to provide as much as possible uh, seamless experience for the engineering teams and the feature teams so that they understand you know, kind of the, the documentation and the entry points for the platform is similar, uh, works in a similar way, regardless of which service uh, we're talking about. We recommend, as we've seen, um, some of the teams of the feature teams are a bit behind in terms of uh, their awareness of the monitoring and telemetry uh, possibilities today. So with the promotions team and, and for Black Friday um, a year ago and, and for Christmas, you had a very good example of how to um, analyze both and, and, and get both business and infrastructure and system metrics. But some of the teams that we've talked about, we've talked with have told us that they don't really have, they don't really know how to do this. So it's much harder for them to understand if the changes they're making to their services are actually bringing um, the benefit that is expected 
for the business uh, and also the implications on the on infrastructure and and the overall resources etc so we we believe this is an area that you could pilot as a new service in the platform around monitoring and telemetry um, and that will give you the chance also to exercise the this more intentional type of interaction with this feature teams. Uh, so that collaboration mode for this new service um, to actually have the platform team and the, and the feature teams working together um, for a defined period of time to understand what do they need and how can that be provided. And finally, the last recommendation, um, as you know, Unicatal is, is probably the most adopted uh, of the platforms today. Uh, almost all the feature teams are at least doing part of their work through, through the CICD uh, platform. And there is a project to move to a SaaS offering, which is, is a great idea, but you still need to have some internal understanding of even if it's a SaaS project, how do we use it? How do we make sure that this product we're using um, is able to meet our um, scalability demands? our isolation demands if we need that between teams um, and so on. And, and if we, we are evolving our delivery pipelines and we're evolving the activities we're doing in the pipelines, then how is this SaaS offering gonna help us? So that means you might need a smaller team if you're not maintaining the infrastructure and the actual servers and, um, or, or cloud resources to run this but even if it's an external offering, you always need some internal layer that understands these issues and is able to um, make this work well for all the uh, feature teams. So this is an, an example of the kind of platform uh, and, and stream teams together. Um, we believe from what we've seen that you actually already have something similar to this. This perhaps has not been defined in this way, but what, what we call here the inner platform is typically the, the kind of lower level services in terms of CICD, monitoring, telemetry, logging, etc. cetera. Um, and on top of that, you can have data services or you already have data services. And those data services and those APIs for data might be using the inner platform as well for their for their monitoring, um, uh, for for actually building those APIs and and creating new versions of those APIs. So in fact, um, we we think that you already have a model similar to this. Um, so part of the the work that needs to be done is to make this more explicit to everyone and and more visible to everyone in the organization. And you have many stream teams or feature teams that are using already these this data services uh, as well as the CICD services, et cetera. So in fact, the platform becomes a kind of onion, if you like, where you have internal platforms um, and the external platforms. But all the teams should be able to use all the services um, in all the platforms. Another part we want to focus on is enablement. So enabling teams are typically a, a small team of experts on some domain. Um, and the domain can be very um, wide or can be narrower. So, and the reason we're talking about enablement is because there are some concerns uh, about cross-functional teams today at Parts Unlimited. Um, some of these teams feel like the skill set has been asked for, from them uh, or the, the kind of activities they're expected to do is too large. Um, even though the, the QA team has been now um, moved into the feature team, so each the teams are getting better at test automation, uh, defining good failure, uh, identifying failure scenarios and so on, but there's still many other areas that they, they lack the skills. And so what ends up happening, some of them are need to take shortcuts and that then basically comes back later um, as an issue or things that need to be reworked and so ends up slowing us down uh, rather than helping. So another concern 
that we've seen, we've basically already hired all the the engineers in available in our area. We're starting. Um, you are starting to look at distributed uh, teams and and engineers, but the issue here is that uh, for many teams they're still reliant on uh, new hires to gain the skills that they need, right? So we have several, or you have several teams that are waiting on hiring a UX uh, designer. Some teams are waiting on getting help from another. Um, security expert that can help them understand the, the what they need to do around that uh, and also some teams have um, complained that even though the guilds have been very helpful to build communities and understanding and knowing other people from other teams with similar roles that they're not necessarily targeting their own team specific needs and so we the purpose of the enabling teams we talk about um, in the in the Team Topologies book and that we think will be helpful for Parts Unlimited are teams of experts that help bridge this kind of capability gaps that we've been talking about. So these gaps can be either more technical or design or product management, whatever it may be. Um, the idea is the same of having a small team of experts. So. As you know, the, the um, Unicorn project was very successful and was to a larger extent thanks to the fact that the, the team was cross-functional. You had people with uh, expertise in many areas from uh, uh, Shannon on, on security and uh, Maxine with architecture and other aspects and so on. So it was a very good uh, mix of, of people. Um, and that's not always feasible. So we, we're seeing some many teams that don't have that right balance. So the perhaps some of those people, others that we identify could then become part of uh, enabling teams around security, around architecture, and work directly with the feature teams to enable and to help them. Um, so that we reduce the dependencies more and more on, on experts that need to do certain parts of the value stream uh, of the work that, that that is needed for delivery. So we want these experts in at Parts Unlimited to actually um, help others and teach others rather than becoming bottlenecks because they are um, the only ones who know how to how to do certain activities. And the way that enabling teams work can take many shapes. Um, the way they, they facilitate knowledge can be with training workshops helping select the right tools and frameworks again to reduce the cognitive load on the uh, stream teams by helping them um, make the right decisions faster and pairing on examples and just providing overall guidance they're not there to do the work of the stream teams but actually help them upskill and uh, facilitate knowledge in general. So this is a more targeted approach than the guilds or communities of practice, which we recommend to continue because they are helpful for, um, again, building communities, uh, sharing uh, good ideas and practices, but they don't necessarily target the specific needs of the teams today. And keep in mind, the success of these enabling teams is the success of the stream teams. Um, the two things cannot be decoupled. They're not there to just be the experts, uh, that the purpose is to uh, enable the stream teams to go faster and to have less dependencies on others. Some of the mains that we have um, identified as possibilities for creating enabling teams, uh, because we've seen that some feature teams are, are struggling with some of this, include uh, continuous delivery, automated testing, and also product development and business and system monitoring. As we, we mentioned before, some teams are struggling to get the, the metrics and get even defining how do I measure if, if this experiment or this change I'm trying to, um, that I'm deploying, that I'm delivering to hopefully get more business or satisfy my customers more? How do I get that information back, that kind of feedback? And other areas like um, design UX and security. 
this is just an initial um, assessment recommendation. Obviously, you should, on a continuous basis, be um, looking at these areas again and see where have we evolved, what is today our kind of bottlenecks, and how can we then enable the feature teams uh, around those areas where they are um, a bit behind or they have dependencies on other teams. And finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about the org dynamics. So we've, we've talked about, uh, we explained this, the four fundamental topologies. So there are also another topology called complicated subsystem, which we um, recommend to avoid, but we have seen perhaps an example at, uh, with the MRP system where you have um, complicated scheduling algorithms. So what we have seen from talking with some of those teams that um, even though they got rid of some of the, the older kind of legacy um, stack and they are now able to focus more on, on, the, on the, the, the value of their system, but the scheduling is very complicated. And so whenever there is a change to the scheduling, uh, this basically shifts the whole focus of the team to this part. And so perhaps it makes sense to have a complicated subsystem around that algorithm that can provide uh, hopefully with a with an API around it. And, and so this complicated subsystem team takes on that um, that cognitive load from the other the other teams working on MRP. Um, so we believe this might be helpful with uh, our helping identify who are the people that could uh, create this complicated subsystem team and help um, go faster overall for uh, the MRP system. And um, we talked briefly about the different interaction modes, the collaboration, the, the providing uh, X as a service and facilitating mostly around enablement. But there's more to organ organization dynamics, right? So we found that uh, one of your Week is this old page with the org chart that you had a couple of years ago at Parts Unlimited. And this reflects very often the kind of org chart that we are designed for, that we expect, uh, or the people designing the org chart expect that the, the um, is enough to identify our teams and ways of working. and. What happens in reality is for most of projects and especially with Horizon 3 projects and ideas, what we face is something much more complex. What we actually need are networks that work well, therefore the, the guilds, therefore the enabling teams, etc. cetera. Um, these networks of, of people that can really identify um, what needs to be done, who can help uh, to get it done. And so this is not to say that the org chart is not valuable uh, like this, but the org chart should not be seen as representing communication lines. It represents hopefully how do you align the top level objectives to all the way down to the to um, the teams on the on the ground, and it also helps reporting uh, bottom up so that the people and um, at the uh, C-level positions can get a, an idea of, of what's going on, but it's not about decision making and it's not about uh, communication lines. Those are different things. So um, we believe this is perhaps you can put a post poster on the wall with this uh, two images because they're very illustrative. This is from the book Team of Teams, um, which is uh, we have also recommended um, to some of the people at Parts Limited. And so when we're talking about organization design and dynamics, it's important to keep in mind, why are we doing this? So if we are restructuring teams uh, and doing some of the things we, we talked about uh, during this presentation, we should be thinking about the why. So one of the key ideas, this um, objectives is to have a rapid flow of change, right? So we want to continuously uh, be able to deliver uh, new value, more value to our customers uh, and do that as quickly as possible. And that means also that we need to think about um, designing organization uh, in 
in parallel with our system architecture. The two things go together. So there is something called Conway's Law. Um, for those of you who have not come across it, it's a talk about the mirroring effect between um, the team structures that we have in the organization and the way they communicate and the actual uh, design of the systems that we're delivering. And so there is a mirroring effect, meaning that if, if we're designing an architecture for systems that is very different from the way the teams are organized and we cannot easily align the teams with the parts of the architecture, then we're going to have a lot of friction. Another way to put it uh, by Ruth Mellon more recently is if, there is if the architecture of the system and the architecture of the organization are at odds, the architecture of the organization wins. So that is going to prevail and um, essentially cause surprises and cause friction when we're trying to um, develop a system where we don't have this alignment between the um, system architecture and the organization architecture. Therefore, the need to co-design. So that means um, you had, recently you had, um, I believe, um, Kurt and Maggie were at the same were, uh, level, if you like. They were making the, taking responsibility for both technical and business outcomes. And so that is, for example, a very good place where to put this kind of um, awareness as well that uh, we also need to co-design and be co-responsible for, for these two aspects. So to recap, rapid flow of change, um, but also co-design of organization and system architecture. Um, and finally, we want to have rapid feedback from the systems and customers, right? So something that you can think about is also how do teams um, who is owning essentially the services and products that um, are still core, but are kind of horizon one, the things that are more in our traditional business areas, in your traditional business areas, and which are um, don't change very frequently, but they still need an owner, right? So at the moment, from what we've seen, this is mostly kind of there's mostly a separation between teams that own uh, so some of those older services don't have an owner some have uh, owner teams or maintenance teams that are different from the teams uh, developing new services and new features so we recommend rethinking this approach because there is a lot of learning that could happen by having for example in, like in this example a single team that owns both new service and an old service. Um, there are synergies there between good practices in the new services and more modern practices that we can try to apply to the older services um, and vice versa. With the older services, we also learn a lot about how to make this resilience if their service that have, has been running for decades with few problems, why is that? How can we take those learnings to the new services, especially as they enter Horizon 2 and become more stable um, and, and uh, a source of revenue for Parts Unlimited. So um, today you have, to some extent, this distinction between maintenance and teams looking at Horizon 3 and Horizon 2. We think um, it would be useful to think about, at the same time, aligning these teams to the, to the business segments that we talk about or the business streams we talked about, um, but also Re realigning the, the ownership of the services. Make sure all the services have an owner and make sure that it's not, there's not a separation between um, teams working on old services and teams working on, on new services. So we think all of these uh, aspects and these principles can help with the five ideals um, that you have at Parts Unlimited, locality and simplicity, um, all that we talked about around the feature or stream teams becoming um, more skilled and helping and having platform services that help them go faster, but in an independent way through self-service that all has to do with locality um, and simplicity. And I would say reducing cognitive load on those teams. Um, 
and hopefully we're increasing the, the focus and increasing the flow of work uh, of the second ideal um, and becoming really a learning organization on team structures as well and on team interactions. So as we interact, as the teams interact, we all should also be learning from that. Understand that those interaction modes we talk about, collaboration, access to service and facilitating, they will have um, flaws at some points or they will have mismatched expectations between teams um, or something that we thought was gonna take two weeks of collaboration is taking two months. This kind of triggers that we should be looking at in terms of how, you know, what is going on here? How can we improve um, our work, improve the way the teams are interacting and align expectations better? Um, and yes, and, and always having psychological safety. So today I didn't go into detail, but um, some of the aspects of this team interactions and types of teams have to do with how they behave um, in terms of being open to other teams, being open to, to teach, but to, uh, to learn as well, focus on the customer, either external or internal uh, in the case of platform teams. So we believe um, what we talked about today and some of these recommendations will help you achieve or, or continue on the path to achieve these ideals and becoming a, a really um, a real learning organization at all levels. And that's all we have uh, for today. I'm happy to take questions from anyone about um, how, what are the ideas going forward or um, questions about what we talked today. Great. So what I can do is source them. I grabbed some of the ones that came in. I also grabbed some that came up earlier that I think might be well addressed by you. So do you want me to just read them sure. off and we can do it that way? Sure. Okay. First one, uh, thanks for the book club with team topologies. Must have been somebody in that book club as well. Do you have some examples where companies are measuring to high cognitive load? Do they measure at the levels in Slack, ServiceNow, Mails, and how booked the meetings room, the meeting rooms are? That is a very interesting question. Um, so we talked about kind of an initial approach, um, which is very straightforward and can bring uh, already a lot of benefit is just asking the teams. Obviously there is some level of uh, subjectivity there, but in the end, what we, what you should care about is that the teams feel, don't feel anxious, that they feel like they are, have kind of the mastery um, of their services that are responsible. Now that said, it's true that um, we're also looking at how to measure um, cognitive load or how at the larger scale. And so there are some interesting uh, initiatives going on. So um, Microsoft has a tool called, um, I believe it's Microsoft Workplace Analytics or, or something similar. I can't recall the exact name right now. Um, so that is exactly looking at uh, communication patterns within chat uh, tools and uh, how often uh, meeting rooms are being booked. Uh, there's also, uh, there are other tools that, um, or at least I know, we know of another organization, a kind of more startup that is working on analyzing Slack communication and channels to try to help give a more overall picture of what's going on. So um, we're looking into that and, and we'll be also helping um, relay that information as we, we get more experience to uh, Maxine and, and everyone else here. Great. I think this one's gonna end up being related. Uh, do you have some examples where companies are measuring little communications within and between teams and how they do it? Um, not that they're measuring per se in terms of uh, some kind of exact numbers. Um, what we have seen are examples of uh, where, especially at the team level, because this is the kind of thing that it's more evident from um, from the point of view of, of, of a team of or people inside a team, we'll see what those tools that I mentioned can bring us. Um, so there are also tools I, I forgot to mention to analyze your code, uh, like tools like Code Scene um, from Adam Thornhill, 
which can look at code base and the history of, of commits and can see where are kind of not only the hotspots, but also uh, if you if you give that tool an idea of which teams exist, then it's able to identify, well, where are the areas where many teams are working on the same code base or where um, unexpected change excuse me, and expected changes were done by one team that was not the responsible for the code base, et cetera. But coming back to, um, to the question, what we have seen, in a, so there's a couple of case studies in the book um, that talk about this, uh, teams that realize either inside the team, the communication um, and the cognitive load is becoming too high. So that means even inside the team, you have subgroups where only some people know how to do something and or only some people work on one of the the streams inside the, the system that they own. Um, and so those are kind of triggers that, well, actually, probably the the, the system or the parts of, of and the services that we own are too large for capacity, for co cognitive capacity. And so there have been several successful cases where they broke up teams so they re-architected to some extent the system in order to allow smaller teams to be more independent and get back to a position where the team as a whole understands the the software they're responsible for uh, well enough to change and support it adequately um, and so this is never um, it, it it's it's never that simple that we just split teams and, and they are totally independent. Obviously there are dependencies still between those teams, but we, the goal is always to try to balance so that teams can do most of the work, perhaps 80% of the work independently and only 20% requires, uh, has a dependency with another team which requires more collaboration uh, with them. Great. There was a, a quick thing. Somebody just mentioned a, a tool you just said, I think answering these past questions. Do you remember what that was? Uh, code scene or the Microsoft tool. Okay. We'll see if that does it. I'll get to the next question here. I can find that information and, and put it on the, on the Slack. Okay. All right. Next we've got, how does the team topology change when the platform team is extremely small and responsible for multiple services and the feature teams are very diverse in the services that they need expect? Yeah. So first of all, um, have more people in the platform teams. Uh, so if they're not adequately sized, then that is going to be an issue. But at the same time, think about what is your in the book we call the thinnest viable platform. What what are the services that are really key? So something that we see and has happened um, in the past, as we, we've had platform with platforms ever since, right? But sometimes these platforms just keep growing and they become this massive kind of black box. Um, so that that is not the platform we should be aiming for. We should aim like at parts unlimited for uh, what are the services that are gonna really bring us benefit and accelerate the teams? Is it CICD, data services, um, provisioning and infrastructure and so on? So we need to be, and that has to do with good product development as well in the platform, we need to be ruthless a little bit uh, as to which services are really the enablers for the for your feature teams, which services are really, and we can track that with, with metrics around which services are being used and which aren't uh, that often. And so we want a small platform that provides high quality services, because if you have to make sure they're reliable, that they're scalable, et cetera, that's gonna require effort. So align teams to the services in the platform, but also cut, cut out services that you don't have a valid use case to maintain. Um, at the same time, you will face situations because the, the tendency is also always at the platform team or group of teams always going to be too small. Um, it will likely grow over time, but perhaps there will be moments where actually there are many requests from the feature teams. So to some extent, there has to be a flexibility to 
first of all, has there has to be a very good uh, roadmap and prioritization that makes sense. But then at some points, the um, the feature team should have the freedom to decide to do things uh, on their own. If the platform team is not able to respond because they have been ruthless in their prioritization and they they have shown that yes they can only commit or work on that request in let's say in six months and the team needs it now or in the next three months the team should have the autonomy to decide that they need to work on that and that later on they might then help push this into the platform to reduce their cognitive load again so it's Therefore, these things are dynamic and it's not always that everything is in the platform or um, it's it's going to be on a contextual basis seeing what makes sense. Like ideally, we would always have enough people in the platform to support the new services, but there will be situations where that, that won't be the, the case. Great. Uh, you got time for another one? Uh, last one, yeah. Any recommendations for how to measure team dynamics and understand areas to focus on? Um, so two things there, perhaps. Um, I think I'm also an uh, engineer uh, from, with computer science background. We tend to focus too much on thinking about measuring and, 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 and scaling and, and thinking kind of trying to have a whole overall picture. The key thing about team dynamics is more around uh, sensing and understanding. We're trying to adopt these behaviors and things are not happening as we expected. Or there's awkward situations or um, things didn't work as we wanted. Take the lessons learned from that to evolve, evolve the team structures, evolve the behaviors um, so that you're more fluid so this is part of being becoming a learning organization so some of these things you cannot measure uh, it's really about the teams and the organization as a whole seeing the that we need kind of become more of a living organism and evolve uh, the teams and the as we as the the, the change as the the demand changes both outside in the market uh, and with new technology but also inside the organization um, so that is that is my question. I know it's not, um, I don't know if it's satisfactory to the person who, who asked, but we can't measure, it's not always a question that we can measure these things. Yes, we can look at the key metrics from Accelerate and kind of overall have an idea of, are we evolving in a way that's helping our um, our goals of shorter lead time, better support, shorter mean time to recovery. Yes, we can, but those things um, we cannot say, oh, it's because we have these teams or we have these interactions. We just need to kind of sense and take feedback from our team dynamics as we evolve. Um, in terms of determining the, perhaps the gaps, I don't know if that's more around uh, skills and, and uh, services that we might be missing. That is a question of talking to the to the teams and identifying the if you talk to to several teams and you see several teams have a need for better monitoring services that can help them uh, then that could be a good candidate for a platform service that is actually what what we saw in the presentation great thank you well we will wrap up here Manuel Pace, everybody, uh, co-author Team Topologies. If you haven't read it, definitely check it out. You can go to teamtopologies.com. Tons of resources, videos, training available there. Uh, Manuel, thank you so much for coming to. Thanks for having me. Club. I hope it was useful. And um, yeah, uh, have a great weekend. Absolutely. See you, everybody. Bye-bye.